delighted to welcome the brand new CEO of Stonewall, Nancy Kelly. Good evening, Nancy. Hi there. I've got my little boys going to bed in the background if you hear quite a lot of new, uh, noise in the background. Okay, it's really, really good. I feel like this is your induction, if you like, to the LGBTQI women's community. Almost 6,000 of us in this group. Um, we're really delighted you could join us. Um, I, want to, I want to start with just asking you um, if you can tell us uh, a bit about your work uh, before Stonewall yeah. and how you ended up at Stonewall. How I've, how, how I've ended up where I am. Yes. So I, I kind of come from like what you might call a broad social justice background. I, I spent the first half of my career working in like campaigning roles in organisations like MIND or um, I used to be head of policy at Refugee Council. So I've, I've worked a lot around issues of like race and gender, but probably most of all on poverty. So I was at the Joseph Rowntree Foundation for about four or five years and ran all of their programs of work on kind of poverty and disadvantage and those kinds of things. So I've got this kind of very broad based social justice background, first in campaigns and then in research. And so the last thing that I did before I came to Stonewall was I was deputy chief exec at the National Centre for Social Research, which is UK's like biggest independent research organisation. It's a charity and it collects a lot of national statistics for government. One of the things I did there is work on the British Social Attitude Survey, which is the kind of best source of data about social attitudes, including to lesbian, gay, bi and trans people. So I've written a fair bit about public attitudes, but I don't come from like inside the LGBT sector. I come from more of a kind of poverty, disadvantage, migration background, but I've worked a lot on um, kind of LGBT issues within that. So I've worked on LGBT asylum and those kinds of things historically. So that's kind of what I came with. And I guess I knew that I wanted to come home. I knew that I wanted to go and to a campaigning voluntary sector organization and to a to a issue I feel really, really passionately about. And and then I saw the Stonewall job come up and, and to be truthful, I never thought I'd get it. Right? <laughs> it was a very long process with lots of lots of um, lots of layers. I think there were seven different stages in the process. And all the way along, I kept thinking, oh, that it's, it's not going to be it's not going to be me. And I think it was hard for me to imagine I'd be this lucky, really. Um, and then I was and I got the job. And that's how I ended up here. So you, you're taking away all my questions, Nancy. Oh. I was going to say, how many interviews did you have to go? Oh God, for? like millions! Oh my God, it, I, like I think, I, I mean, some terrifying. The 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 most terrifying stage was I did a live media interview, like a a kind of mocked up test and a kind of hostile one, so like difficult issues, in a real TV studio, being interviewed by the actual Evan Harris with two of my actual trustees watching live outside. It was completely kind of terrifying, but yeah, that was the scariest bit, but they, they put me through my paces a lot going through the process. So um, I, was, I was tired, but very happy when they finally said they were interested in me coming on board. And, and have you done a lot of media work as a matter of interest? Because obviously you're going to be very much in the, in the public spotlight now. Yeah, yeah, I have, going back a long time. So at Natsen, I did a fair amount of media work, including on quite controversial stuff. I've done quite, I've done work, for instance, on racism and how many of us think we're racist. The answer is still quite a lot. Um, and LGBT attitudes, quite a lot of work on political attitudes in my last job. Probably the thing that's most similar to this is um, when I was head of policy at Refugee Council, I did a lot of, in fact, most of the Re Refugee Council's media work. And obviously, migration is an issue that is quite contested and that, you know, a lot of people have got very strong views about. So I was kind of very regularly on telly and in the papers doing that, like every week, that kind of thing. But for most of my career, well, at least most of my career since I've been a bit older, uh, doing kind of live and pre-recorded media work and writing for the papers and stuff has been part of what I do. Mm. Yeah. I was, I was actually going to ask you about one of your interviews, actually, to, now we're on to the media work. And um, I think this may, was this maybe your first mainstream interview you did in The Guardian? Yeah, um, with, with Nasheen, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, in it, uh, could, you, uh, could you elaborate a little bit? Because one of the comments that um, I, I, I picked up on um, was, was uh, 
it was attributed to you. So I just wanted to, mm -hmm. it could have come across as a bit of a critical of a previous uh, Stonewall. So yeah. it, um, here, here is the, it says that Stonewall no, would no longer seek to convert people to their way of thinking. Um, could you could you explain a bit what you what, you what was like? What was I saying and what wasn't I saying? I guess yes. the, first, the first thing to say is like um, the the media is quite obsessed with trans people at the minute. So I spoke for an hour and a half, mostly not about trans rights. And that, that's the kind of, that's what comes out the other end, which I was talking to Ruth and she said she once gave an hour long interview on Rainbow Laces, the sports programme, and somebody wrote a thousand word piece on uh, trans, trans rights. So that's the first thing to say. What I was talking about actually was the, was the online debate and, and how kind of toxic it is and how there's this idea kind of when you come in as a new chief exec of Stonewall, um, a lot of people kind of say, well, you have to kind of fix that or you have to convince people that are kind of really deeply opposed, whether for religious or ideological reasons to trans inclusion. You have to convince them um, to agree with you or you have to kind of come to an agreement. And there, and I guess my sense is that if we focus on kind of fighting the ideological fight, like I'm an intersectional feminist. I believe trans women are women. I would absolutely love everybody to feel the same way, right? I would. I think the world would be better. But when I think about the general public, I think, well, in order for trans women, trans men, non-binary folks' lives to be better, we don't need everyone to agree with that. We do need everyone to agree that trans folks' rights should be respected, that they should be supported to live kind of dignified, full lives. And so I was kind of trying to talk about that piece. Like, there are a bunch of people who aren't intersectional feminists who want trans people to be uh, loved and valued and have good lives. And I want us to, to kind of talk with those people and, and support those people. Um, and it certainly wasn't criticism of Ruth. Actually, I did talk about Ruth in that interview with, with great admiration. Um, I think that what she did, particularly in kind of leading Stonewall through the process of becoming fully trans inclusive was amazing. And I feel like in a lot of ways she did the hard yards for me. Um, so certainly ni neither was any criticism made of Ruth nor was any intended by any of that. Mm. Well, thanks for clearing that up. I just... Uh... I wanted to ask you that because we had a few questions coming in. In fact, I've had questions coming in all day, so I've uh, selected uh, what I think are really juicy ones, and I hope everyone agrees <laughs> with me. <laughs> um, you know, going on from uh, the conversation we just had about uh, what you're saying about uh, trans inclusiveness, mm -hmm. etc., um, there is obviously still uh, so much to do for our trans siblings, mm -hmm. our trans siblings to achieve equality. But do um, the LGB community um, still have equal, you know, fights they need to for equal rights? Like, I wish I could say no, right? I wish I could say Stonewall's job was done for, for people like me and you, right? But it, it obviously isn't. I think there's a couple of things in my mind about particularly Stonewall's kind of place in the movement as regards LGB rights. And and some of it is about our global work, like we work now outside the UK and particularly try and work in jurisdictions where it is still illegal to be gay or lesbian, those kinds of things. There's a huge job of work to do globally and in Europe, actually, and you've seen the really regressive stuff that ha that's happening in, in Poland and Hungary at the minute, for instance. But actually in the UK, what I feel like is as a movement we've taken the first step we've got a lot of the legal rights but having legal rights doesn't mean that your day-to-day -day life is inclusive and positive and that you're kind of able to exercise those rights so you know for, for me the work that we do in workplaces to make them more inclusive in schools to kind of try to eradicate homophobic biphobic, transphobic bullying, the work that we do with the health service to try and make sure that it provides an inclusive service to our community. Um, that's all of the work that, you know, all of those kinds of things are the sort of work that needs to still happen. And, and it's in a way it's harder. I mean, it's hard to change the law, but it's not as hard as changing all of those institutions and all of those communities. And for me, that's, there's still a lot, a lot of work to do there. 
Yeah, I mean, um, I don't know if you know, I personally was on the board of GLAD in the USA for six yeah. years, and, and one of their biggest saying was about changing hearts and minds. So, yeah. you know, often uh, the law might be changed, but people's um, attitudes at work haven't been changed, which brings me on to a question that's come in uh, just now. Um, Maybe you could explain a little bit to the uninitiated what stone will actually do as well. What, you know? what are we doing? What do we do? We well, yeah. have to bear with me. I'm only on like I think week four, <laughs> so I'll probably miss loads of stuff out. So don't tell any of my colleagues. So we've got a kind of massive program of work with employers called Diversity Champions. Um, and what it's doing is working with employers to make sure that their policies, their practices are inclusive of LGBT people. And some of that, you'll have seen things like the Workplace Equality Index and all of that kind of thing. But some of it is also really targeted. So in some, some organisations might, for instance, be really focusing on the experience of lesbian and bi women. And we would be like supporting them to develop programmes that are inclusive in that space. So it's kind of, it's not really a one size fits all. So there's hundreds of employers. And there's a global version of that where we work with multinational employers. Um, to try and achieve the same thing, often in really kind of difficult contexts. And those employers also are incredibly supportive, often outside of their work. So um, they will come out publicly around issues of trans inclusion or conversion therapy, and they will kind of be advocates within the community for um, LGBT rights. We do a ton of work around schools, and some of that is around um, big programs that are designed to, to make teachers more confident tackling bullying and building like inclusive primary and secondary school environments for um, uh, for LGBT children and young people. We do increasing amounts of kind of youth activist work. So kind of supporting the next generation of activist women from our, from our community, that kind of thing. Um, and we work with youth settings. So there's a lot of kind of work out in those institutions trying to change them. Um, and we still do a lot of policy work, both in the UK and globally. So we work on things like the Gender Recognition Act or conversion therapy, but we also work on things like access to healthcare, on hate crime to try and get the law and policy um, uh, kind of moving in the right direction. And increasingly, we work very directly with community activists and with smaller um, kind of activist groups to try and make sure that we're elevating voices from across the community and we're learning from and listening to all of those people. That's a bit of a whistle stop tour. I probably forgot loads of stuff. Nobody, nobody tell anybody that I actually work with to listen to that list. But those are the big blocks. Well, Jacqueline um, and M Millen Yarwood, that is some mouthful, I'm glad I got it out, uh, is asking on, on the subject of diversity champions. Um, <laughs> she's saying, obviously, you may be COVID impacted right now, but we'll go on to talk about that. But um, she's asking, um, she actually came on during the week and she was having some problems at work. And I said to contact Stonewall to talk uh, uh, you know, to get the Diversity Champions programme involved. And she's asking um, how long does it take for Stonewall to respond to corporates because her manager has been rude about uh, pronoun, pronouns mm -hmm. and she wants Stonewall to come in and, and talk to her organisation. So from the moment of contacting to somebody coming in, what's the process? And if it depends, and we're quite impacted by COVID at the minute, so that, that some of my team are on furlough, so it can be a bit slower. If it's an organisation that we already have a relationship with, if they are a diversity champion, it's a bit easier because we have a relationship with them. And then the, the their account manager, the person that works with that organisation will find it very kind of easy to reach out and have a conversation. If it's an organisation that we don't have a relationship with, that's a bit more difficult because that's that's us cold calling them effectively. Um, but we are always really interested, even if even if you know it's not an organisation we're already working with to get that feedback and to do whatever we can in terms of trying to create those kind of more inclusive workplaces. I don't want to promise a number of days in case I, in case in case it turns out to be a lie because quite about half of that team are currently on furlough for, because of COVID. So, yeah, we've got a lot of COVID uh, questions coming in. Um, Carol yeah. Anderson is asking, um, how do you think workplace changes um, workplace changes as a result of COVID increased remote working, for example, will impact will impact DNI at work? You know, I think it's really, it's a complicated question. I think there's, 
there's a real tendency and I think particularly kind of people in leadership positions are starting to go oh look it's this brave new world there's all of these things that are great that we've learned from this way of working and certainly I've seen some of that around diversity and inclusion at work type programs so we've been able to kind of do a big digital learning series in terms of our, instead of our workplace conference I've been involved in kind of with big global employers and their DNI initiatives and so getting people together is obviously cheaper and you can have these really good interactions about programs of work so there's all of that and I think that's all true but on the other hand I just feel really conscious of I guess the value of being in community with each other actually being in a room after this many months of mostly only being in a room with my own family I really miss that and how important that is particularly for LGBT folk and how this kind of communication is a is good but it's not the same and I worry about mental health and I worry about isolation. So I guess I'm in two minds about it. I think it adds ways of working that can be helpful as part of an overall DNI program in the workplace. But it adds. We shouldn't kind of think, oh, we don't need to be together, uh, you know, as an LGBT staff group, or we don't need to be together to talk about these issues. I think we still need to be together in in real life. Maybe that's just because I really like personal contact. But I think the sort of isolation and mental health impacts really worry me. Okay, Polly Shute is asking, um, what, what impact has, has COVID had on Stonewall? So a lot, like a lot of organisations, it's been a big hit to our finances, like all voluntary sector income, um, like all voluntary sector organisations. Um, but it's it's a hit we're able to manage, you know, we're, you know, I, we're not we're not going to sort of fall over in a corner anytime soon, but it's difficult. And one of the consequences of that is that we've got a lot of, we're having to furlough a lot of staff and rotate furlough a lot of staff. What I would say though, is it's been just absolutely incredible what colleagues have been able to do and continue to do and the kind of dynamism and creativity that they've shown, like adapt, we've had to adapt a lot of our programs to be delivered digitally. And we've, you know, we've delivered a ton of digital workplace work already we're about to go live with a ton more educational digital products and all of that kind of repurposing and recreating has happened under huge pressure and with like this smaller staff team we've done these fantastic media campaigns around pride and collaborated around pride inside and things like that so so it's it's been hard but i think it's also really kind of shown the talent and the commitment and just the incredible creativity in the team i've just been i've been grow from that okay so we've got a question coming in from i want to say hello to char bailey she's a uh, our host for saturday's diva pride a little plug there um <laughs> hope you'll be recording a video for us nancy to say happy diva pride um, i will char bailey is asking um what stonewall stance on on the blm move movement on the Black Lives Matter movement. Yeah, BLM. Yeah, okay. So one of the things, one of the things that we're talking a lot about, and that I feel really passionate about, is the idea of kind of linked liberation movements. The idea that that kind of nobody's free till everyone's free, and and I think thinking through and taking action around meaningful race equity is really important to me and to Stonewall and we've been in a long conversation about how we do that more effectively both inside of organization and outside of our organization I think we have got a long way to go but it's a really active conversation within and a really active program within the organization and uh, I think for me in terms of the Black Lives Matters movement I find it like incredibly inspirational I think it offers like not only just huge hope in terms of kind of new potential for transformative change around racial justice but also other intersecting um, injustices and I think it provides a model for what a movement can look like when it's intersectional I think it's always been so embracing of LGBT identities and so intersectional in that way I think the LGBT movement has got a lot to learn including Stonewall from Black Lives Matters about being like truly intersectional around race around disability those sorts of things like I think it's it, it, you know it, I, I have just endless admiration for for that movement 
Well, I've got I've got a question, uh, and this one is from somebody called Linda Riley. Me. <laughs> no, uh, you're doppelganger. You've not conned someone called Linda Riley to write in just to just to fool everybody. That's good. That's right. That's right. Um, uh, I feel very passionate about lesbian visibility, uh, which is one of the reasons I founded Lesbian Visibility Week. Um, I the Hobbit Day does not have an L attributed to it. Um, it you know it talks about homophobia transphobia and biphobia but not lesbophobia um there are some people that uh, that argue that the h includes uh, for homophobia includes lesbophobia lesbophobia but many lesbians feel that their visibility has been limited by this and would like the l in in, in this uh, day, day um what is your view and, and stonewall's view I don't know what Stonewall's view is, but I'll give you mine. It's probably dangerous for a new chief exec, right? Um, I, th you know, I guess firstly, I really feel professionally, but also personally, really conscious of of lesbian invisibility in the way within the movement that kind of gay men's concerns and experiences have often been prioritised over our concerns and experiences, and at a really personal level. It, my, my American wife would say it chaps my ass. It chaps my ass when people kind of say like gay covers lesbians and gays or, 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 or things like this, like Ida Hobbit and there doesn't need to be an L in there. So at a personal level, I'd like to see greater visibility. And I, and I think it's important to understand that like homophobia and lesbophobia don't look the same or sound the same or work in the same way just as it's important to understand you know there are connections between biphobia lesbophobia homophobia transphobia etc but they're not identical and they don't hurt us in exactly the same way and it's important to be able to see all of that and talk about all of that so so I guess for, for me personally I am prepared to join your campaign for the L to be in in Ida Hobbit yes that's it I'll me and you will be like on a which call it a tandem bike. We'll we'll ride around the US and and uh, and the UK, kind of campaigning on on getting an L into it. I'll, I'm I'm in. Okay, well let's see it this time next year. We will see the L there. <laughs> let's go for it. I like that. Um, on another uh, another question that came in earlier was, um, does Stonewall have anything going on which specifically targets LGBTQI women, um, and is the women's comedy night? Uh, going to be going ahead maybe not this year but yeah you know. yeah so um so yes we do so obviously all of our kind of programs include kind of focus on women and lgbt plus women but um we also do some specific work in that area and kind of a couple of examples that i would give we recently just published this amazing report that's based on our out of the margins program which is one of our global programs of work where we've been working across 22 low and middle income countries with um small human rights ngos in those countries and focusing on the experiences of um lesbians of bi women and of trans women in those countries and the kind of aim has been to kind of elevate those voices and those experiences and kind of coordinate advocacy and action around the experiences of women in those countries so that's it, it only came out a few weeks ago the report but i'd really kind of recommend it to people particularly if you're interested in lgbt rights internationally we do quite a lot of work in the healthcare space that's quite specific so um, we do work around mental health in particular because we know some parts of our community particularly by women actually are extremely um, kind of disproportionately affected around things like anxiety. Um, we do quite a lot of work about lesbian and trans women's access to healthcare and uh, access to sort of supportive, um, to supportive and appropriate healthcare. And we do quite a lot of work around unequal access to facility services for, for lesbians. So kind of a lot of people will be familiar with the, the way in which you get a bit of a postcode lottery about access to NHS fertility services. So that's something we've worked on. And in all of those things, we're doing really a combination of kind of policy lobbying, kind of working with decision makers or working with the NHS or those sorts of things and working with our diversity champions. We've got, I think, just over 80 NHS trusts that are part of the DC programme. So we're able to kind of directly influence through that. And then we're all, we've also been working more recently about uh, around domestic abuse and um, 
misogyny as a hate crime. So um, we've been working to try and ensure that the kind of program of work that comes out of the new domestic abuse bill centres lesbian, bi and trans women as particularly at risk groups so that money flows and services flow into into our community to meet that need. And I've just started um, kind of working again with Stella Creasy, who's been trying to get a amendment through to make misogyny uh, a hate crime, to kind of categorise misogynist hate crimes. And that we've got a little bit of a way to go to kind of make sure that it also includes trans women, but we're incredibly excited to be doing that work to, to support and protect women across our community. So those are kind of some of the examples of the work that we do that's targeting specifically women within the LGBT community, but then it's a big theme of, of a lot of our programmes. Okay, um, Lisa Power. Um, your... Is it actual Lisa? Yep, the actual Lisa, one of the co-founders of Stone. I love her so much. Hello, Lisa. <laughs> she's, she's asking, um, how, how have your first few weeks been and what's been your biggest surprise, apart from Lisa asking me this question? Apart from Lisa asking me this question. Um, uh, my first few weeks, the first week was just pretty hardcore because I kind of arrived and, you know, we had a lot of stuff going on and the pandemic and the GRA leak and Black Lives Matter movement. It was just, it was a bit like, and there was me and I was totally useless. I didn't even know who anyone was. But, but since then, it's been fantastic. I feel really excited. I feel really energized. The team's amazing. There's a lot to do. It's really challenging, but it's, it's exciting. It's great. It's an amazing place to be. Um, in terms of what's most surprising, actually, I, I sort of, well, can I say two things, Linda? I'm allowed two answers to this. Right, okay. Professionally, I guess I've been really surprised in a great way by the level of influence Stonewall is able to have around, particularly around, you know, I've done some work with big global corporates who are talking about like trying to implement trans inclusive parenting policies and uh, lesbian and bi women inclusive parenting policies across countries that have got really socially conservative kind of uh, laws and really socially conservative cultures and so to just see these kind of these enormous organizations kind of work with Stonewall and trust Stonewall and work towards just this really kind of inclusive vision is kind of amazing like I I that was a sort of surprise in a good way to me and the the, the other thing that's been a surprise and actually Lisa's a bit part of it is kind of the symbolism of Stonewall and what it feels like to them have the privilege of being the chief exec of Stonewall and and I kind of came into it thinking well you know, not, I guess not thinking about that and, and like getting to meet people like Lisa, or I was, I was saying, I, I managed to have a meeting with Angela Mason this week. I was saying to, to Linda before, before we went on air or, you know, or, or Michael Cashman or, and to, to sort of really feel and touch the symbolism of the organization and what he has meant to other people. It's meant an enormous amount to me you know, I'm, a, I'm an adopter. My wife and I have been married for, I think, 13 years now, hopefully lucky 13. And so it's transformed my life. Right. And I know I know what it has meant to me. But to sort of touch that history and see that symbolism has been kind of, I don't know, amazing, surprising, amazing, kind of a bit a bit trippy. So we've got a question coming from Deborah Lane Winter. Uh, she's asking, what is your key focus at Stonewall this year? So the big job of work we've got to do is, is write a new strategy, right? So we're right at the end of our old strategy. So over the next couple of months, we'll be working internally, but also across the movement and with partner organisations to try and understand what, what shape we should be for the next three to five years. So that's the sort of 
big immediate job and then I think as well as that it's kind of nurturing all of the things that are great about the organization already including and most importantly the people and we've got some kind of big kind of fights on our hands around trans rights but also around conversion therapy those sorts of things so there's a lot of immediate stuff and then there's also this kind of amazing job of thinking about how do we kind of evolve as an organization that's the that's certainly the next six months it's hard to see beyond that at the minute well, the question that's come in a few times, and I think I know the answer from earlier, but I'm just going to sort of reiterate because it's coming in so much. Um, uh, Baroness Hunt, shall we say now, or, or Ruth? Um, Ruth, yeah. She, she did such a great job, as you said, on, on, on um, trans rights and, and, and changing Stonewall stance, if you like. Yeah. Is that something that you're going to continue? I think yeah. people really want to know that. Ab you know, absolutely. There is, you know, there is no future in which I'm the chief exec of Stonewall and we don't remain absolutely every bit as committed to trans rights and trans inclusion and we don't remain absolute every every bit as committed to race equity to the inclusion of kind of our communities in kind of all their glory and all their all their diversity right so I can't I can't say it unequivocally enough I actually I actually said it in my interview I said if you don't want to go that journey then don't give me the job so definitely I think that like what our strategy is in all of those areas is different and I think around trans rights in particular I'm really keen that we work like in a really humble way with the trans community and with trans community organizations and are led by them and don't kind of speak over them but but support them and work with them and partner in a really generous way um, and I think that's that's kind of that feels really incredibly important to me and that's how we're trying to work around kind of G GRA influencing is in a way that really kind of centers the perspectives of, of trans-led organizations. Yeah, well, uh, as you know, I'm an average social media user and I've seen you do some great tweets and really put yourself out there personally. So uh, um, I have no doubt that you're gonna uh, continue this. I was way. quite excited. I was the subject of quite a bad pile on, which I, I, I shouldn't admit this, but I've got all my replies turned off. So I can't actually, say. if you're saying something nice to me and I don't reply, it's because I've had to turn my replies off if I don't follow you, because otherwise like my entire feed is full of um, difficult tweets, should we say. But I, I realized I'd had a pile on around some of my trans inclusive tweeting because two of my gay friends sent me a, a big bouquet of flowers and I didn't know why, <laughs> it's because they felt bad. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah, no, uh, it's quite, uh, to be on the end of that, I know I really do feel for you, but um, well done and congratulations. Um, Lou Thomas is, um, she's asking, she's asking, um, uh, just reading, because some of these questions are quite long, so I'm trying to sort of... No, it's like, I, 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 between you having to, to read the very complex, subtle questions and me having to answer them, I'm like, I need a drink before this one's over, Linda. My God. I think I, think I need one too. Like a three-part question coming or something, isn't it? Okay, I'll br I'm braced. I'm in the brace position for a complicated question. I'm, I'm actually having to show that I've got some intellect today and I don't usually do that. So here we go. Um, um, St Stonewall, uh, she, she, Carol Anderson is actually asking, um, it would be great to see the strengthening of the four nation approach with Stonewall mm. and um, uh, t sometimes Stonewall's work has, uh, has felt very self-centric. Is that yeah. something you think and is that something that you're working on? Yes, completely agree. Right. So, um, so as I've said, I'm all, uh, already kind of working really closely with Fergal and the Rainbow Project, our partners in Northern Ireland and with Colin up in Scotland and with the team, Leston and the rest of the team down in, in Cymru. But I agree, like we we actually do a ton of work all over the UK, but I think we can sound quite London centric. One of the things that I've been really pleased to do is kind of reach out to and, and have a great first meeting with Carl, who's Andy Burnham's advisor up in Manchester. I think we should have like a really um, a kind of good footprint and good partnerships there, you know, obviously, in you know, alongside foundation and 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 local LGBT groups. But I think it's really it's really important, I guess, when I think about the strategy. I think about the fact that Stonewall's purpose is to improve the lives of all LGBT people. And that, that means that means a lot in terms of both where we work and what we do, but also kind of what we sound like and what concerns we talk to. And I, so I'm a working class northerner, although I've lived down south for a very long time now. And I think 
I think that idea of kind of either being or in Stonewall's case sounding kind of like you come from a very particular part of the UK and you have a very particular set of concerns I don't think that's quite right or quite helpful I think it's really important that we are kind of visible and accountable and engaged with the whole community and I'm really excited for that. Hmm. Bobby Picard, um, I don't know if you've met Bobby, uh, Bobby started, she started um, Trans in the City last year, okay. uh, she's saying she works with a lot of global cor corporations, she calls them corps, so called Bobby, um, that, that work really closely with Stonewall and, and she, you know, who she loves to bits. Um, these corporations really work hard to make a lot of changes, but then, um, that, but then feel that they get beaten up at, at the WEI uh, time. If you could explain what that is, I, you know, the Work Equality Index, Workplace Equality Index, uh, when they get compared with tiny companies. Now, um, mm. what can what can what can we do to improve things? And she says as well, thank you for being awesome trans ally. Oh, God, that's so kind. So the Workplace Equality Index, it's kind of, I don't know, it's like the Eurovision of um, LGBT plus inclusion in the workplace. I'm going to call it that. Don't come for me. Um, and uh, we're, we're actually looking at it at the minute and revising it. And one of the things that we're trying to think about is how we make it, is how we address, I think, what you're talking about, Bobby, how we make it, you know, a better tool for change for creating change in companies and how we make it more sensitive to the kinds of differences that you're describing because because you, you're right there are some things it's really easy for a very small organization particularly one working in a particularly in a in a kind of liberal environment to do that are much harder for larger organizations that are even harder again for global organizations that might be working in kind of a very wide range of of country contexts so you know we're looking at that right now because obviously with covid we wanted to give everyone a year off from kind of going through their getting their homework marked on an annual basis um and you know i'm sure you're already in touch with the team but if you're not we'd love to hear from you because now is a really good time to talk about how that should be reshaped and we're talking with um with with all of the kind of participants in the wei about exactly the same thing um but yeah i recognize what you're describing it's a great time to come to us and talk about it well, this is just such a great interview. There's so many positive comments. Uh, I don't know if your heads if you look at it. <laughs> um, is everyone loving my lockdown hair? I, I need some hair, love. It's, sure it's getting, I haven't had hair this long since I was a long time ago. Let's just say a long time ago. <laughs> it was a while. <laughs> Char, Char Bailey's asking, and, and I do like this question, Char. She's asking, how can we, as members of the community, get involved or add value to Stonewall and the work you do? Well, that's a great question. So um, we like it's really great if people can get involved in our campaigns work and support our campaigns. And if you follow us on Twitter, we will quite often be um, kind of putting out calls to action. That are, and some of them will be for Stonewall campaigns and then other times when it's the right thing to do, we'll be amplifying campaigns by other LGBT organisations. So a great example of that would be um, when gender, Gendered Intelligence came up with the great Trust Me campaign, instead of us going, well, let's do one that's like it with the Stonewall brand, we went, okay, let's push this out and try and get all of our supporters to um, engage and use that to write to their MPs etc so um, we really love for people to kind of follow us on Insta and on Twitter and Facebook and all of that kind of thing and engage in campaigns um, it's great when people can volunteer for us and there are a range of ways in which you can volunteer and when those volunteering opportunities come up that would be fantastic to have people support it is great if you can come and work for us when you're looking for a job or if when we're advertising for um for new positions like we're about to advertise for a director in Cymru, if you can boost that so that kind of our our, um, our kind of advert gets far and wide. It's obviously great for people to donate if they're in a position to do so, but there are just a ton of ways in which, which people can be involved. And we really kind of welcome that. And, and also it's great if people can get involved in our programs. We do a lot of work in the community around building advocacy skills and activism and, you know kind of recommending people to get involved in our projects and and getting involved in our projects yourself is is also a fantastic way to support us 
So we're, we're coming to the end of your time in the hot seat. So a couple more. Uh... I've nearly made it to my whiskey sour. My wife's behind me. She's going she's gonna to pour me a whiskey sour as soon as I've got to the end. Do you think she might say hello? Obviously, the questions yeah. are, can we, can we, can we Jen, say hello? Do you want to come and say hello? She's, she's got her pyjamas on and everything. <laughs> hello. Hi, are you all right? Hello. Are you, there you go. Are you, are you listening to all this, Jen? She can only hear your side of it because I've oh. got these kind of very fetching, oh. sexy, you know, headphones on. <laughs> Thank you very much for the, the introduction. Um, uh, couldn't, couldn't resist that. Um, so I've got a couple more questions just before we close. Uh, Hilda Montiel is asking, uh, was it a long-term goal or a short-term goal to become? Is it something you always wanted to be? The CEO of Stonewall, and uh, what's your what's your vision for the future going forward with Stonewall? It's a long term goal. So I was talking earlier about Angela Mason, and when I first moved to London, she was. She, this is this is dating me. Obviously, I only look twenty one, and we should all agree on this, right? But uh, she was CEO of Stonewall, and I remember. I shook a bucket at the party for the equalization of the age of consent and in fact got an amazing t-shirt that I lived in for years for this for this pleasure and I just remember looking at her and thinking oh my you know oh my god what an incredible inspirational woman and what an incredible organization and so I mean the idea of being able to be the chief exec of a social justice organization has always been my goal for it to be Stonewall is so kind of a long term, a long term goal and a just I'm still getting used to it. So getting used to how much of a privilege that is. Right. Um, and my, my vision for the future, like I'm, some of the things that I'm thinking about are some of the things we've talked about, about a stone wall that's connected across geography in the UK, across different parts of the UK, but also beyond it. And it feels really important to me that we have a stone wall that um, that looks across the life course, that looks at what it's like growing up LGBT plus or parenting, that looks at like what it's like in working life, in our health services, in our communities, but also what it's like aging in our community. And I think that's a, an area Stonewall maybe hasn't been in enough. And that feels really important that we're doing, we have that kind of approach to our community across its life course. And it feels really important to me as well that we're confident and clear about where we should be talking about particular parts of our community so it's really important to me that we do do work that is just about bi folk or just about lesbians or just about trans people and that we know when we should be doing that and it's really and also that we are confident doing work about some of our most marginalized community members so kind of lgbt asylum seekers and those kinds of things so I'm not I'm trying not to kind of pin it all down because I want to have a really great open conversation with partners and with colleagues and with community members. But those are the things when I look to the future and where I want to take the organisation. Those are some of the things I'm thinking about. I'm going to finish off with um, just talking a little bit about, you know, the division that's been mm -hmm. in the community in, uh, over the, this particular over the last few years. Mm -hmm. um, do you see uh, Stonewall playing a role in trying to kind of uh, work on that division and, 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 and helping or do you have any thoughts on that? I think, do you know, one of the things that I find hard to tell is how much, how much division there is not online, right? Mm -hmm. and, and this isn't me being kind of circumspect, it's me just trying to be honest, like there's a mess online, it's a hot mess and it's hideous and toxic. But in real life, that's not actually how we treat each other, even when we don't agree. And, and so I think that kind of being part of talking like kindly and respectfully with each other and being, being part of being part of the conversation in a way that says you don't have to agree with everything about how I see the world for me to kind of have have the ability to listen to you and and care about your thoughts and be able to talk to you and be in dialogue with you all of those things feel incredibly important to me um whether stonewall can play a part in kind of fixing the very sort of toxic digital version of that i, I don't know 
I'd love I'd love to see it be less toxic that's for sure because it's it's awful for for any anybody that comes into contact with it and particularly for trans women and and trans men but um but I don't know I feel like I'm not and I'm not enough of an expert in how these kind of online phenomena kind of emerge to know how how you contribute really helpfully to to I don't know like taking the heat out but outside of that digital realm I think the community isn't as divided as it seems and we have enormous amounts in common and broadly we treat each other with a lot of compassion I'm really committed to that that is a that is just so lovely to hear actually uh uh, Rusty Singleton, who's also known as Horse, um, has come in to say, you're such a breath of um, fresh air, and I, and I absolutely agree. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's just been really, really wonderful to interview you and, and for the community to hear your thoughts, and uh, good luck with the role going forward. I know you've Thank been you. for a while. Thank you. Of any bit of anybody two minutes, you've already talked me into co-running Lesbian Visibility Work Week <laughs> and going on a tandem to campaign for the L to be in Ida Hobbit. I'm going to avoid talking to you, Linda. Every time I talk to you, I agree to do something else. Doing a big long list. Let me tell you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Really Thanks a lot. All right, bye bye. Bye. -bye. bye.